Hello, and welcome to the Vamp Storytelling Showcase. The theme of this show is Smile. Are you ready for some laughs, some tears, some gosh darn true stories? Then clap one hand against the other, wherever you are, and say hello to your excellent producer, Victoria Leva. Hey everyone, welcome to So Say We All's Monthly Vamp. I am this month's producer and talent wrangler, Victoria Leva. This month, we have the best theme for you. It is all about positivity and smiles. So before we get started, we are an organization that can run with people just like you watching us and supporting us. We used to collect $5 from Whistle Stop every show we had, but now we have a membership system. You can support us for as little as $8 a month to keep things running. You go to the link below and you can sign up. Super easy, super rad, please do that. We might be able to give you sensual back massages in return, but we're still kind of deciding on whether to do that or not, you know. Now, if you're asking, how does VAMP work? It is a little bit of a process, but it's pretty cool. First, we have submissions that are given to a blind panel of judges. Those judges read what they like, what fits the theme the best. We get it all together. Next, we have critique sessions, and then we have performance and writing coaches who work their magic, and then before you know it, we have a show. Um, here at Associate, we all we believe that everyone has a captivating story to tell. Plenty of stories to tell, and we hope that we can hear some of yours soon. Um, and finally, at our live shows, we like to check in on each other. We used to be able to pass our drinks around, you know, before COVID, and just say, how are you? How are you? Are you okay? And well, we can't really do that right now, but what we can do is we can show some love in the comment section, hold our loved ones a little closer, snuggle our pets a little tighter, and just remember, we're getting through this together, and we'll be back eventually. <laughs> now, for our lovely performers, we have Kim Buck, Jay Carroll, Anastasia Zydyke, Keon Green, Louise Julig, Jay Rhodes Bart Barnhart, and Delia Knight. There is an aspirin on top of the frog. It is my second week of work as a temp with the Bellagio horticulture team. The conservatory, located right past the lobby, is one of the most visited attractions in Las Vegas. Five million people each year come to see the blooming plants, creative decor, and the floral sculpture we call props that require hundreds of thousands of stems of product each month. One of the five million people decided to cop a squat on the frog. The horticulture team replaces everything that is dead, broken, or in the frog's case, defiled. And I am ready. As someone who has worked in floral design for almost 20 years, working at Bellagio is the dream. This is elite level design and more than any other job I've had, I wanted to prove my worth and work ethic straight away. Next to the frog stands two large snails made entirely of fresh flowers. A wire framework in the shape of the animal is shoved full of foam and we sculpt the image with fresh floral. I go to work on the frog removing the ass print from its back. My coworker looks at it and mutters, fucking drunks. The conservatory is made of six beds which feature their own unique piece of the collective show. The center bed features a large water wheel with a koi pond below it. There are other water features, little garden benches and bridges that lead across tiny streams, the larger than life floral props, tiny boats and rows and rows of potted plants finish off each bed and act as a barrier between the public and delicate props. Drunks generally don't realize such barriers, so we come in every morning to broken and stolen plants and flowers and like little fix it fairies, we go about righting the wrongs. It's 5.18 on a Tuesday morning. I am talking to a man who was drunk several drinks ago, trying not to convince him to dump his cocktail into the koi pond. My coworker flags down a security officer from the front lobby while I keep the drunk busy. I tell him that koi exists in a delicate ecosystem that does not include a watered down Jack and Coke. Besides, total bonus, no drink for the koi means more drink for him. The security guard comes up to us, nods to me as if to say, I can handle this now, and I nod an indebted thank you in return. I walk back over to the task at hand. 
I begin pulling plants aside to get to work, to my workspace. The floor of ancient plywood smelling of mildew and mold. Tiny gnats swarm the plant so much so that I keep my mouth closed as much as possible. The morning progresses in the dim light and late night drunks give way to the smell of freshly brewed coffee and warm danishes. Bermuda shorted tourists appear with their cell phones to take pictures and ask an endless barrage of questions. In my first week, when well-meaning guests approached me, I immediately looked to a coworker who would come over and answer everything. They were cheery and informative, smiling all the while, answering questions they've been asked. Once the tourist turned and left, my coworker turned to me. You're gonna get the same questions all the time. It would probably be a good idea for you to learn some of these things, just in case one of us isn't around to help. She smiled, went back to her bucket and the garden creature she was working on. We were supposed to be cheery brand ambassadors. Being a consummate overachiever and wanting to prove my worth as the new girl, I took it upon myself to learn everything I could for any possible question that could be asked. Where's the closest bathroom? Uh, where's the lost and found? <laughs> where's the chocolate fountain? <sighs> How do you get to the pool? Uh, where's the lost and found? Is there a Starbucks here? Hmm. Uh, where is the lost and found? I was prepared for every question except one. It happened in my second week. I was seated on my bucket near the frog, frantically repairing it from the drunken ass defilement when a couple came up to me at the edge of the bed. Even after working there for a couple weeks, I could tell when a guest wanted something, but perhaps was too shy to ask. Following the lead of my coworkers, I smiled, got up from my bucket and gingerly stepped across a slippery plywood. Good morning, can I help you with something? Yes, the husband answered. Can we take a picture of you working? I'm sorry? You, putting in the flowers, please, a picture. Okay. I returned to my bucket and sat down and looked toward the cell phone pointed in my direction. As I held up a stem above the frog's cheek, why am I going to be in someone's vacation photos? Fucking weird. Smile, the husband said, and years of theater training kicked in. A dazzling smile pulled my mouth up by the corners, and I flashed my pearly whites. They looked at the cell phone screen and nodded their approval. I became a fully realized zoo exhibit. People visit Las Vegas in droves every year to experience the lie, and all I could do was perpetuate it. Visitors want to witness the manufactured beauty of the conservatory. Plants lined up in neat rows, kept in pots, never taking root anywhere. It wasn't the wild and awe-inspiring beauty of what is found in nature. It was the heavily stylized and organized beauty meant to keep visitors and their dollars returning to Bellagio. In that moment, answering that question with a posed smile, I became part of the lie. It was the first job I've ever had where I was on stage answering questions and posing for pictures. I kept my head down and tried to avoid eye contact. Frequently I would hear, you must love your job, to which I would instinctively look up with a giant smile on my face, trying to find phrases that express the reaction the guest was looking for. Yes, of course, I'm so blessed. I tried to keep it short and simple, knowing my smile and nod would sell it. My temp position turned into an offer, a full-time offer. Almost every person I worked with cautioned against me taking it. I would get stuck here and regret it, they said. But it paid well and had benefits, and I cut through most of the awkward getting to know you phase with coworkers, having been there six weeks. Soon, I was dressed in the uniform of the department, something that looked cross between a zookeeper and an inmate. Even though the uniform was ugly and ill-fitting, I aspired to wear it. It meant that I was part of the team part of the lie. I tended to floral arrangements all over several hotels I was assigned to upkeep. In nearly six years of work, I have fielded all sorts of questions and comments about the nature of the work I was doing. I grew tired of the, you must love your job, remark. It was almost exclusively uttered by women of retirement age who thought the job I did was a shining example of the beauty and bounty of nature. 
but to me, it was more than just flowers and art for others' enjoyment. I loved the late mornings I spent in the restaurant Picasso, tending to the floral while the beef stock and sharp cheese sauce aromas wafted into the dining room. I meandered about, looking at all the original Picasso works hung in the space, the color, the brush strokes, the history. I loved studying each piece, noticing something new each time. I enjoyed going out on the patio to watch the fountain show, humming along to Sinatra or Elvis, the boom of the fountains like cannons, closing my eyes as a fine mist of water fell across my face. Some days, I felt like the only person witnessing such beauty. Then there were the other days, the day a guest called me over to ask what I thought was a question, but wanted to hit on me while he had his dick out pissing in a dark corner. Or the morning a jackass kept taking my picture while I was up on a ladder and bent ever over ever so slightly, gathering up stems and putting them in the trash. I finally asked what he wanted and he just slid a room key across the counter at me and backed away, winking the whole time. Not everyone who comes to Vegas is a dick. <laughs> Some people come for shows and world-class cuisine. Some crave that feeling that they can do all the dirty they want in a town that will keep their secrets. Nothing bad will follow them back to Wichita or Shreveport or whatever corner of the globe they come from. I offered a smile and sometimes a flower to in individuals who chatted me up. Even though it wasn't authentic, it was something. A gift to people who visited Las Vegas with a very specific idea of it as a place where everyone worked, everyone who worked loved their perfect job and offered a smile and friendly demeanor to prove it. My last day was last March. It's been over a year since I've worked at Bellagio full time. A coworker and I knew something was up when on a Friday night, we dealt with no leering drunks, no one asked where the lost and found was, and no one took my picture. When we got back to the warehouse, we were herded into a conference room and promptly laid off. Being part of the first wave of layoffs, I was spared the sight of empty corridors and deserted casino floors. I've been called back to work on a temporary basis three times. I'm next in line based on seniority to be called back to my permanent position. The pandemic has wreaked havoc on numerous aspects of life. My way to comfort and soothe during this time of crisis is food. I ate my feelings by the fistful. A lot of melted cheese, warm bread, and ice cream. And since hand wringing doesn't burn a lot of calories, I've packed on the pounds. My work uniform that used to fit nicely now fits like the porn version of this job. Pants that look spray painted on and a shirt that doesn't button at or above my chest. One morning getting dressed, I felt as though I was suffocating. My breath quickened, my heart rate jumped and every seam felt like it was burning into my skin. I took a pair of scissors and I started to cut. I cut my short sleeves to the shoulder seam and the waistband of my two tight pants. If necessity is the mother of invention, then modification is its weird uncle. I could breathe again. After she hulking my work uniform, I took something back. In a year where nothing has been okay, where the entire world turned upside down, I threw a tantrum with scissors. Fitting back into my newly tailored uniform, I embraced the lie. It was okay for me to overflow the seams of my uniform to call out the lie and engage in it at the same time. It was okay to have an authentic love for what I do and question the person I had to become to do it. As I put down the scissors and put on a sweater that covered my big girl alterations, my mouth pulled upward at the corners and a smile spread across my lips. I'd seen the guy on my earlier pass up the central walkway at the Carlsbad Outlet Mall. A 20-something Greenpeace volunteer with a clipboard, wearing a scarf and Chuck Taylors, trying to cajole passing Christmas shoppers to sign a petition. I was with my 10-year-old daughter on a strategic strike. Get in, get out. 
No eye contact, I thought, as we walked past him. I knew that if we made eye contact, I'd feel obligated to stop. I would end up listening to his spiel and then have to politely explain that I did not want to sign his petition to save the Redwoods or whatever it was he wanted. <laughs> and yes, I was sure, and yes, he made a very good point, and I actually do care about the Redwoods, but I still don't want to sign the petition. I was raised to be polite, even to strangers, even when I feel annoyed. But the last thing I wanted was to get suckered in by a clipboard wielder. So as my daughter and I were passing back through the mall on our way out, we walked purposefully. There weren't very many shoppers, so we couldn't blend into the crowd and just disappear. We were practically speed walking past clipboard guy and had just managed to skirt past him when I heard him call out behind me. Maybe you'd be happier if you smiled more. And I felt something snap inside. <laughs> All my life, people had been telling me to smile. When I was a kid and a teenager, I chalked it up to adults being annoying. But it kept happening even as I got older. Once, when I was in college, I was shopping at Mission Valley Mall, walking past a small group coming the other way, when one of them looked at me and said, smile, it can't be that bad. I still remember, more than 30 years later, the tightening right below my sternum as the words landed. What the hell was that? I felt like I'd been sandbagged, but I just kept walking. I was too stunned to say anything, and anyway, they were well past me by the time it registered. I hadn't been in a bad mood before, but after that I sure was. I could not understand why strangers seemed compelled to comment on my facial expression while I was minding my own damn business. Then one day, years later, I was complaining to another mother, a friend of mine from my daughter's school, about this seemingly inexplicable phenomenon. She laughed and said, oh, you must have resting bitch face. <laughs> resting what? <laughs> resting bitch face. Haven't you seen that YouTube? It's hilarious. It's when your natural resting face makes you look bitchy. Look it up. Was that why I got so many comments? Because I looked bitchy when I was just lost in thought? Or preoccupied? Or insert any emotion here besides deliriously happy? It was quite possible I did have resting bitch face. I remembered how in family snapshots, my father often managed, no matter what the occasion, to look like his best friend just died. I did wonder why he looked that way in pictures when he wasn't a glum person, but I got used to it. That's just dad, I think. I smiled in photos because it seemed like it was expected and I was a pleaser. But when my face was at rest, well, I guess I didn't know what it looked like. Maybe dad had passed resting bitch face on to me. Or maybe it wasn't resting bitch face, but some trait inherited from my Danish ancestors. The curse of the Danes. That day at the outlet mall with my daughter, when the clipboard guy called after me about needing to smile more, hit a nerve. It was as though all the times I had never reacted before were like water that had been slowly rising drop by drop by drop behind a dam of politeness. And this was one drop too many. The dam gave way in an instant, and I felt a full-blown wave of rage crashing over me. I wheeled around and yelled, You don't know me! You don't know anything about me! <laughs> the clipboard guy was just standing there, but my eyes weren't really registering what was in front of me as my fury took over. I jutted my chin out and gesticulated with my hand, drawing an imaginary circle in front of my face. This is what my face looks like, okay? I yelled. It just does this, so you should mind your own business. <laughs> Some part of me realized that I was about to lose the power of coherent speech. I flailed my arm. I wasn't used to acting out. My body didn't know what to do. I was also becoming conscious again of my daughter next to me, wary the way a kid gets when their parent has just jumped the rails. <laughs> Yelling at strangers was not something I did. 
If anything, my daughter had seen me go out of my way to be friendly to strangers, or at least polite. But her mother had just gone ballistic. Then, almost as quickly as it had risen, my anger receded, leaving an aftertaste of embarrassment mixed with resigned weariness. The guy had not been phased by my tirade, standing placidly the whole time. Now I just wanted to get out of there. I wasn't sure I had accomplished anything besides making a spectacle of myself in front of my daughter. And she was a kid who kept her cards close to her chest, so I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I shot her a sideways glance. Let's go, I said, turning back around. We'd gone about another ten feet when I heard the guy's voice behind me. I love you. <laughs> Asshole, I thought. <laughs> Careful not to say it out loud. When I'd watched that YouTube video, it seemed to solve the mystery I had lived with all my life. I had a problem with my face. Strangers felt compelled to tell me to smile because I looked bitchy, or maybe depressed. But it turns out there was still one more piece to the puzzle. A couple years ago, I described in an essay a similar incident that occurred when I was in college, writing that it made me want to punch the person telling me to smile. A friend of mine read it and said he couldn't understand why the narrator in the piece was so defensive. <clears throat> He felt the comments about smiling were friendly and playful. Wait, what? Friendly and playful? I thought wanting to punch these people would be a universally understood reaction. <clears throat> I started to worry that maybe I was the only one so irritated by these comments. Then, finally, the last piece of the puzzle clicked into place. It wasn't that people were telling me to smile. Men were telling me to smile. I realized all the comments over the years had come from men. And the friends who understood how I felt, who got it, were women. One of them sent me an article about the sexism of telling women to smile and reading other stories of women who were just as sick of this as I was made me feel so seen. And I realized that this is not really about what is happening on my face. When you tell me to smile, it is not friendly and playful, no matter how jocular you think you are being. It's a command. A command that tells me your reaction to what I look like is more important than whatever I might be feeling. A command that tells me I don't have a right to just exist and look the way I do. A command that tells me you think I owe you something for just being in front of you. I do not have a problem with my face. You have a problem with your sense of entitlement to make comments about my face. <laughs> I recently asked my daughter, now 22, if she remembered anything from the incident at the mall. Yeah, that guy was being an asshole, she said. It was pretty uncomfortable in the moment, but I was also glad you said something, that you didn't just take it. She also told me that even at that age, she recognized that people often made assumptions about her mood based on her face because she's not very expressive, and it always bothered her. I did a quick mental inventory, trying to remember if I'd ever told her to smile. Fortunately, I couldn't remember ever doing so. It's true that I often can't tell what her mood is, but I've learned to either just ask or let her be. She doesn't owe me a smile, and I tell myself, that's just my daughter. For the record, I am not anti-smile. I love a good smile, when there's a reason for it. And I often smile at grocery clerks, waiters, people I pass on the sidewalk, even panhandlers. If they smile back, I feel good. We had a human connection for half a second. If they don't, it doesn't bother me. But I read stories where women were told to smile by random men after just visiting a mother with advanced dementia, losing a brother to an overdose, or losing a job. They were told they looked too serious or mean and that they really needed to cheer up. 
So here's a public service announcement for guys who don't want to be assholes. <laughs> if you see me out and about and I'm not smiling, you've got two choices. A, assume it's none of your business and leave me alone. Or B, if you truly want to spread a little sunshine, just give me one of your smiles. A genuine, authentic, non-creepy one that acknowledges me as a fellow human being. And maybe you might get one back. I grew up in a small town in southeastern Kentucky, the type of place where everyone knows everyone. Like most families in the Bible Belt, mine was deeply religious. My mom often joked that her Aquanet teased hair needed to be so large, because the taller the hair, the closer to Jesus. <laughs> Twice every Sunday and once on Wednesday nights, we'd go to church, the kind where the preacher stands behind a pulpit, red-faced with veins pulsing under his skin, speaking so fast you're certain if he doesn't stop and take a breath, he will surely pass out. <laughs> they preach about the end of days, fire and brimstone, and how sinful the world had become. At least once a month, I heard all about how the prostitutes and homosexuals anger God so much with their sinful ways. The congregation always answered with shouts of, Praise God! And Amen! <laughs> when I was a young boy, my dad decided to toughen me up, so I didn't become one of those sissy boys. I didn't even know what that meant. A week later, he signed me up for a peewee basketball league. It was a short-lived experience. <laughs> I spent the majority of the first and only practice on the sidelines doing cartwheels with the cheerleaders, instead of paying attention to the coach. Once puberty hit, I began to understand his concern. While most boys my age obsessed over how hot Britney Spears was, I obsessed over Justin Timberlake. But I had been taught that being gay was a first-class, one-way ticket straight to hell. My feelings were kept a secret. With each and every passing impure thought, I began building a wall over my closet door. I tried everything to deny who I really was. I dated girls to convince my friends and family that I was straight, and I'd lay awake at night and pray silently to God, tears streaming down my cheeks. I begged and pleaded for him to change me. I silently wished for him to take these awful, unnatural feelings away. But the answer to my prayers never came. I kept my desires hidden always fearful of my secret getting out. By the end of my senior year of high school, I knew I couldn't maintain my big lie forever. My only chance at being who I really was required me to go away for college. My parents wanted me to stay home and go to a community college in the neighboring county. They worried if I were to live on campus, I'd start drinking and doing things other kids my age had been doing at high school parties for years. I finally convinced them to let me go to the University of the Cumberlands, a small Christian college located about 45 minutes west of my hometown, just far enough away that I could live on campus and get the full college experience, but with strict enough rules that my parents would allow me to go. It was here that I met the first gay men I ever knew, my sweet mates Noah and Daniel. They kept their relationship mostly hidden, but eventually shared it with me. Finally, I had met people like me, we became quick friends. In the beginning, I tried to maintain that I was straight, even with them. The fear of it getting back to my family was hardwired into me, not to mention that a few years prior, the university had kicked a student out because he was gay, a fact my parents had loved. My sweetmates grew up in a similar family to mine, so they knew the risks of being outed, and as our bond grew, I let down my walls, and for the first time, I shared my secret. Even after telling Daniel and Noah, I still struggled. I knew that being true to myself would set me free of the crushing weight of self-hatred, but the price of that decision would ultimately mean losing the love of my parents. Not long after telling Noah and Daniel, they exposed me to my first gay bar, Carousel. <laughs> it was there that I saw my first drag show, kissed my first boy, and met my first love. Jason was out and proud, but understood my need for secrecy. It wasn't long after that that I began to yearn for the same freedom that I had with my friends at school at home. Over Thanksgiving break, I convinced myself it would be safe to bring my sister into my world. I walked downstairs, went into her room, and shut the door. Hey, sis, can we, um, talk for a minute? 
What's wrong? What did you do now? She immediately sensed the worry behind my question. I need to tell you something, but I need to know that you'll always love me, no matter what. Her brow crinkled as worry spread across her face. I'll always love you. You're my baby brother. Okay, where's the body? I'll grab the shovels. I know, but th this is different. This is something major, and I couldn't bear it if you hated me. Okay, you're really starting to scare me. Just spit it out already. There was now concern in her voice. Sis, the speech I had rehearsed all morning suddenly escaping my memory. Well, when I told you about my girlfriend, well, Jessica is actually Jason, and I'm gay. She paused for a moment and then smiled. I've known since you were 10 years old. I will always love you. I don't care if you date a girl or a boy. It makes no difference to me. Mom and Dad cannot find out. You know how they feel about gay people. But the knot in my chest was finally starting to loosen. Don't worry. Your secret is safe with me. She reached out and gave me a hug. And for once, I didn't feel like a stranger in my own home. It was a cold winter afternoon in December. The type of day you can see your breath hanging in the air in front of you and the wind, it feels like knives. I was sitting in the university cafeteria. My friends and I were eating lunch in between our finals and discussing our last trip to Carousel that coming weekend before we all went home for winter break. It had been weeks since I'd seen Jason and I was dying to have some fun after dauntless hours of relentless studying. My phone rang. I glanced at the caller ID. Hey mom, what's up? Her reply came in a tone unlike one I'd ever heard. We need to talk. My stomach sank, like the feeling you get when you narrowly avoid a car crash. My body went rigid, and my mouth felt like it was filled with cotton. From my mom's tone, either someone was dead, or my sister had spilled the beans. The roar of the lunchroom chatter suddenly felt miles away. My friends could instantly tell by my face, whatever was being said on the other end of the phone was not good news. They fell silent as I continued. Um, sure. Is everything okay? She paused for a moment. When were you going to tell me about Jason? Fuck. This was it. The moment I had feared my entire life. I knew I had to make a choice. My brain began turning. Option one. I could try and deny it. But for her to muster the courage to even make this call and confront me with these accusations meant she already knew everything. Option two. Finally open up and tell the truth regardless of the outcome. I glanced around the table filled with faces of friends who loved the real me, and I was still feeling the high from the positive experience between me and my sister. I knew it was now or never. Yes, Mom, I'm gay. The silence on the other end of the line was suddenly deafening and seemed to last for decades. With each passing second, my heart raced faster, my palms sweat more, and the urge to throw up was almost unavoidable. <laughs> what the hell have I just done? But it was too late. I couldn't take it back. My worst nightmare was playing out before my eyes, except I wasn't sleeping. And to make matters worse, the realization that my sister must have betrayed me washed over me. After what felt like forever, my mom finally spoke. If this is the life you choose to live, we will not support it. You better find a place to stay because you aren't welcome under our roof. We raised you better than that, and the choice you're making, it's an abomination to God. Mom. I'm sorry, but it's not a choice. It's something I've struggled with my entire life. I've just been too afraid to tell you and Dad. The despair turned to rage in her voice as she replied, I just don't understand how you'd want to do that. It's disgusting. You're going to get AIDS, and no one will ever want to be around you. The anger built inside my chest. The surge of bravery I'd felt moments ago bubbled back up to the surface, and I shot back, This is who I am. If you can't accept me for that, I understand. But I can't do this anymore. I cannot keep hurting myself just to please you. In a phone call that lasted less than 20 minutes, the brick wall I had spent my entire life building shattered like glass. The rest of the night, I bounced around with regret and pride. I had so much to figure out. Without my parents' signature for my student loans, I couldn't return to school in January, let alone hope to stay on campus over the holiday break. My one safe space where I'd finally found acceptance was going to be ripped from the clutches of my fingers. Yet for the first time in over 18 years, I finally felt free. No more secrets. No more unending guilt. 
and no more rehearsing outcomes in my head. I wasn't sure where my life would go, but one thing was certain. It was finally my life. It took over a decade to recover from that conversation. My family held true to their threat. I wasn't allowed back home, and they did indeed cut me off financially. After many years of not speaking, we have since managed to form some sort of relationship. We still don't discuss that part of my life, although I wish they would realize their errors, or at least learn to accept me for who I am. Sadly, they have not. But I have realized the only acceptance I need is my own. My sister and I are thick as thieves once again. She regrets telling my secret, though she had the best of intentions. She believed she could save me from the fear I felt of telling our parents. She knew they'd be upset, but thought they'd be over it by Christmas break. She never imagined our parents would react the way they did. But I now see that if she hadn't told them, my life may not be what it is today. In those darkest moments long ago, I learned how truly courageous I could be. I choose to surround myself with people who accept me for who I am. I now have a life that many would envy a husband who loves me unconditionally, our own home, and two Huskies. I'm a small business owner, and I finally have the opportunity to finish my degree. I only wish I could reach out to that lonely kid and let him know, not to spend so many years inside a closeted jail cell, to tell him, your life won't turn out like you think it will. It will be more than you ever dreamed possible. My maternal grandmother was formidable. Grossmutter, as we called her, emigrated from Germany barely out of her teens, worked as a domestic in New York, married young, and raised five children. By the time her 19 grandchildren came along, she and my grossvater had two homes, including a lake house where they regularly hosted boisterous family gatherings for dozens of people. I remember Grossmutter bustling about, muttering, Ach du Liebe! at the lack of discipline her grandchildren displayed. <laughs> discipline, duty, and decorum were big with Grossmutter. She rose many a morning before dawn to bake Burukuchen and swim half a mile across the cold lake, breaststroke. She was exceptionally talented at all kinds of needlework. One year she cro crocheted bikinis for all her granddaughters, and her garden was the envy of the neighborhood. The sad and strange thing was, she did not seem to take much pleasure in any of it, not that anyone could see. To call her stern would be an understatement, aside from when pictures were being taken, when her lips took a hint of an upturn, I rarely saw her smile. And if she ever laughed, which was rarer still, she held her hand in front of her face, as if trying to hide any sign of joy. As a result, like most people that knew her, I always believed my grossmother to be a deeply unhappy woman. That is, until I was 27 and pregnant with my first child. I was visiting my aunt and uncle at their beach house in Delaware where grossmother was staying for the summer. One evening, everyone else in the house went out on a go-karting adventure and the two of us, me being pregnant and my grandmother being old, were left behind. Alone with her for one of the first times ever, I decided to ask grossmother about her life. And over the course of the next three or four hours, she told me things few in our family knew. I learned that her father, a chaplain, had died during World War I, leaving her mother a widow with six children, beyond poor. So after my grandmother came of age, arrangements were made for her to travel to the United States. I learned that she came over third class in the belly of a German steamer, found work as a cook for a wealthy dentist upon her arrival, and lived in a small room on the top floor of the dentist's brownstone in Brooklyn. I learned her social life consisted of going to a Tornverein, a social gathering for German immigrants, and it was there she met my grandfather. He was not her first choice, she told me, which, to be honest, was not a surprise. My mother had always said Grossmutter looked down on Grossvater, both literally, she was 5'8", to his 5'4", and figuratively, since he was from a farm and did not speak Hochdeutsch, or High German. What did surprise me was when Grossmutter said she'd been in love with another man at the Tornverein, a tall, good-looking blonde man. 
a man who'd chosen not my grandmother, but a tall, good-looking blonde woman with a beautiful smile. Grossmutter had moved on, she said, accepting Grossvater's offer of marriage because she'd thought him to be a decent man, solid, dependable. He'd been a good husband and father. He'd worked hard, she'd been dutiful, and they'd built a life together. Not the life she'd imagined as a girl, but a good life. She didn't mention love, and at that point I must have asked her if she was happy. I must have mentioned the not smiling thing because I distinctly remember her saying, into every life a little rain must fall, before adding, she didn't refrain from smiling because she was unhappy. And then she told me a story about a fall she'd had back in Germany before she emigrated, a face first fall on an icy street in which she cracked a couple of teeth. It had been painful and embarrassing, she said, but her mother could barely afford food, let alone pay for a dentist. So Grossmutter simply kept her lips shut tight to hide the damage. Months later, while working for the dentist's family in Brooklyn, she began to develop excruciating headaches, which she attributed to spending hours over a gas stove. Ever dutiful, she said nothing for several more months. Only under duress did she finally admit to the dentist's wife she was finding it difficult to function day to day. And only after a plumber came to the house to say it wasn't because of the gas did the family look for other reasons for her pain. Ironically, the cause turned out to be the fall back in Germany, the face first fall that cracked her teeth, and now she lived with a dentist. He arranged for x-rays, determined the best course of action, and at age 21, all of my grandmother's front teeth were pulled from her mouth. All of them. Before the fall on the ice, she said, she'd had beautiful, strong, straight teeth, and with one slip, they were gone. Who would want a woman without teeth? Though the dentist eventually provided her with dentures restoring her smile, she had grown out of the habit of employing it. Sitting there with my gray-haired grandmother that night at the beach, I envisioned the young girl she'd once been, a girl with beautiful, strong, straight teeth that had been broken. I knew countless people had judged her character based on her stern appearance. I knew she'd been seen as unemotional, even unfriendly, and she'd lost opportunities for companionship and love. She'd kept her mouth shut, and a narrative of bad teeth and pain had shaped her life. The thing was, listening to her story, I related it to it in a way I hadn't seen coming. As a teenager, I'd been in a serious bike accident during which I landed on my face. My braces had been the only thing holding my teeth in my mouth, and reseating them was a painful process. Moreover, a few short years later, oral surgery to remove my wisdom teeth had gone terribly wrong, requiring the breaking of my jaw. By the time Grossmutter was sharing her story with pregnant me at the beach, I was starting to smile with my lips shut tight because despite the dentistry done after the accident, my front teeth were dying a slow death and beginning to turn gray. In this particular case, a slow death was good. I was looking for any reason to delay taking action because I did not like dentists. No, nope, that's not true. I hated dentists <laughs> and feared them. Though I understood the stakes, I delayed dealing with those dead teeth for five more years. And by the time I started, my gross mother had died and I'd forgotten or perhaps repressed her story. Over the course of the next two decades, my visits to the dentist involved excessive weeping, mortified apologizing, and increasing amounts of medication. Novocaine, nitrous oxide, anti-anxiety medication the evening before and the day of the procedure. The hygienist once brought my teenage daughter in to hold my hand because I was crying so hard. My daughter tried to reason with me during and afterward, but I could not see that my tears and fears were unwarranted. They'd become part of a narrative of bad teeth and pain of which I was the author. But then, a couple of years ago, I wrote a story about my bike accident and my subsequent fear of dentists. And after sharing the story, reading it aloud to a bar full of strangers, not only did I embrace the fact that writing about it had been cathartic and healing, I embraced the idea that I could edit my life narrative at the time, I had one final dying tooth I'd been avoiding dealing with, and post-reading catharsis, I decided to confront the situation head-on. So I called to schedule an appointment to have the work done. Do you need Dr. Nick to call on a prescription for hydroxyzine? The nurse asked. Nope, I'm good, I said resolutely. 
but you want the nitrous oxide, right? Nope, I don't think I'm going to need that either. <laughs> really? Her skepticism was warranted. I think I actually had a reputation at Dr. Nick's office, a reputation I was determined to change. No Novocaine, I told Dr. Nick's nurse the morning of the appointment. No medication of any kind. The nurse looked at me as if I were insane. Are you sure? You're scheduled for crown prep. It's going to be pretty painful. I'm sure, I said, though I wasn't sure at all. I knew a drill would be involved. A drill. And those little scrapey tools that mimic the sound of chalk on a blackboard if the chalk was a scrapey tool and my teeth were the blackboard. Well, you're going to have to talk to Dr. Nick about that, she said. Dr. Nick was also concerned. He'd only had a couple of patients choose not to use any kind of pain relief, and it hadn't gone well. I remembered the opening scene from A Million Little Pieces when the author undergoes a root canal without any medication and how I thought it was totally unrealistic, how when I found out parts of the memoir had been <laughs> fictionalized, I was sure it was that part. I understood Dr. Nick's doubts. Okay, he finally said, but the Novocaine and nitrous are right here. If you need anything at any point, stop me. He added that I might want to raise my feet off the end of the chair and s engage in a sideways scissor kick to keep my mind off the pain. I tried it out. My next words probably convinced him I was nuts. This is perfect, I said. I can get in an ab workout at the same time. <laughs> I remember the sound of the drill and the scrapey tools, scissor kicking as if my life depended on it, and Dr. Nick asking every once in a while, how you doing? I remember thinking there were centuries of human existence without Novocaine or nitrous oxide or hydroxyzine. A hazy scene from Gone with the Wind in the Atlanta train depot filled my head, followed by a shadowy image on a wall of a surgeon wielding a saw and a poor guy screaming, no, no, don't take the leg. <laughs> I thought about all the people who'd slugged whiskey or clamped their teeth down on a piece of leather to survive far worse than what I was going through. Other images flitted through my head, women in childbirth, men in trenches. And then, oddly enough, another image came to mind. The scene with an elderly couple from the movie of Titanic spooning on a lower berth in the belly of the ship as water rushes under the door. And my thoughts turned to my gross mother leaving everything behind to travel in the belly of a ship, having all of her front teeth pulled from her mouth, marrying her second choice after her first choice chose someone with a beautiful smile. I remembered her comment about rain falling into a life and how after she died, I learned she'd silently carried guilt for decades over the loss of twins from her first pregnancy, twins she didn't know she was carrying until they came too soon. And I worried wondered about all the stories she didn't tell me. My grandmother lived in a different time with different rules about duty, discipline, and decorum. But lying there, scissor kicking, I couldn't help but wonder if she would have had more room for joy if she had shared more of her sorrows. Honestly, with everything going on in my head, the 80 minutes of that particular dental procedure passed relatively quickly. I know I was in pain, but thankfully, I don't recall the pain itself. When all was said and done, foregoing Novocaine and laughing gas did not change my life. But the idea of controlling one's narrative, that remains a powerful lesson. And I think of my gross mother and the stories we all hold inside, the ones we close our lips tight against the very ones that spoken aloud might set us free. Honey, we're pregnant. She's got this dreamy smile on her face and she's got this pregnancy test in one hand. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Honey, we are. It's a Thursday night in beautiful San Diego, California. 
November 14, 2019, at 8.56 p.m., I got the news that my wife Jennifer and I are expecting a baby. At this moment, I realize my life will change forever and experience will be my number one teacher. Don't get me wrong, being parents and starting a family was something we both talked about and we both looked forward to, but this caught us by surprise. How are we going to afford a baby? <laughs> are we even ready? We're living in a single bedroom apartment for goodness sake. So how do I make this work? With so many emotions, so many feelings and all the tears of joy, realizing that I would be a father made me proud. I could hold my chest up a little farther and hold my head up a little higher. I am the man in my little book of coolness because I am going to be a father. <laughs> Honey, wake up. We have a doctor's appointment to get to, Jennifer says. On our way to our first appointment, I am nervous. My heart begins to beat faster. The palms of my hands are all clammy and sweaty. Jennifer and I sit in the doctor's office, whispering back and forth at each other when the doctor enters the room. Today, we're gonna listen to the baby's heartbeat for the first time, the doctor says. I eagerly look at the doctor as she examines Jennifer. She puts a glob of gel on her belly, then pressing slowly side to side with this very sophisticated wand-like instrument. She's looking for our baby's heartbeat. I'm looking up at the monitor and the doctors start looking concerned. So naturally, I get concerned. The room goes silent. Is the baby lost in there? Is there a baby even in there? She found it. The baby's heartbeat. That moment was so clutch to me. It was like the first man landing on the moon, like winning a Grammy award, like throwing the Hail Mary game winning touchdown pass in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. I hit the jackpot. It was that big. Our growing baby is looking normal and what a sigh of relief. From that moment on, I did my very best to prepare for fatherhood. I read a book titled, We're Pregnant, The First Time Dad's Pregnancy Handbook. <laughs> this book teaches the do's and the don'ts, like to be gentle and kind because she may be very emotional, to never, ever, ever talk about her weight, <laughs> to, be, to be helpful and cook meals and keep the house clean for her, to compliment her. Maybe it's something I should be doing all the time. It was much needed preparation too, because I had no idea what the heck I was doing. For me, this was trial and error at its finest. One night, I went out to pick up some grub. <sighs> Welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? Yeah, uh, can I get two Big Macs, a uh, McDouble, a McChicken with cheese, a 20 piece nugget with six barbecue sauces, <laughs> Two large fries, a large Sprite, and a large Coke. <sighs> Anything else? Yeah, two apple pies. Thank you. <laughs> I got the whole order right. When I return home, Jennifer looks at me and asks, um, where's the ice cream? <laughs> I look at her like, what ice cream? I quickly learned to always get ice cream. <laughs> After a long nine months, the big day arrives. It's Thursday, July 16th, 2020. I'm the photographer taking pictures and video of Jennifer walking into Sharp Mary Birch Hospital that day. We are so excited. The whole hospital seemed empty and we are not ready for what would transpire over the next few days. So we get all settled in for the night. I say, honey, the baby will be here in the morning. Jennifer smiles and lays back in bed. I watch from a short distance as the nurse welcomes Jennifer to the labor room. The room was huge. There was a whole nurse station set up next to her bed, another station that looked like a Wayne scale or something. Jennifer seems nice and calm, but the nurse warned active labor will begin in the morning. 
we're going to be here for a while. So I set up my little bed. It was like a bus stop bench, kind of hard, layered with a thin pad. I could barely fit on it. I lay there across the room looking at my wife and I can't fall asleep for some reason. I was anxious, a little scared. And just to think, I wasn't even bringing a baby into the world. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine how Jennifer is feeling, but it is sweet dreams to me. The morning came, honey, wake up. It's around five in the morning. I woke up all groggy. Honey, how are you? I'm in a little pain, she says. She's in some real pain now. I look over at her. She's hooked up to all kinds of stuff. There's an IV in her arm feeding her pain medication, you know, fentanyl. <laughs> and a baby monitor is strapped around her belly, monitoring, monitoring our baby's heartbeat and the contractions. Jennifer is only experiencing the first contractions. Then the nurse comes in. Jennifer looked her square in the eye. Can I just have a C-section? <laughs> the nurse responds like, we're going to try to make this baby come naturally, OK? Jennifer was hurting, and she wanted to get it over with already. As the first day passed, there were times when the baby's heart was too fast, and my wife was in excruciating pain. I stood there watching in silence while her whole body shook frantically like she was in an earthquake or something. My words meant nothing to her. I mean, they had what seemed like a seismograph machine measuring her progress. The request had suddenly changed from, honey, wake up, to, honey, can you please stay up with me? I knew I wasn't getting any sleep that night, so I stayed up, doing the best I could to comfort my pain-stricken wife. I rested my head and fell asleep at some point that night, maybe around three in the morning. Honey, wake up. I look at the clock and it's around four in the morning. I took a deep breath and sprung up off the bench. Yes, my love, what is it? Is the baby here yet? Hold my hand, honey, she says. All she wants is for me to hold her hand. I am exhausted and deranged with worry mixed with the reality of being in the hospital and I can see fear in her eyes. After 32 hours of labor, the obstetrician decides it's in our baby's best interest to consider having a C-section. That option was music to my wife's ears. <laughs> Please, immediately, Jennifer says. 26 minutes later, we head to the operating room and the doctor is ready to take Jennifer in for the procedure. I feel a surge of energy and my nerves are jumping through the roof. I can see them wheeling Jennifer down the hallway. They took her away with all the medical equipment and two nurses escorted me to the waiting area. As I stand there and wait all tired, I keep wondering, how is Jennifer doing? On top of, what will my baby look like? Finally, I'm escorted to the operating room. I instantly notice the refrigerator-like temperature of the room and the bright lighting. There's a huddle of doctors and nurses hovering over Jennifer. A nurse guides me behind a screen that Jennifer's head pokes out of, blocking any visuals from our side of the screen of the operation. Hey, hi, she says. Then within seconds, I hear a faint cry travel across the operating room. It's my baby, oh my God, and he's crying. I swear it was the cutest thing I ever heard. On my right, I have my wife, Jennifer, and on my left, I looked up and there he is, Logan Hunter Green, looking back at me with his bright big eyes. Two of the nurses wiped him off, calling me over to complete the traditional umbilical cord cut. I cut the cord perfectly. <laughs> I took a real good look at him. Logan is absolutely perfect. One of the nurses wrapped him in blankets and handed him over to me. I then walked him towards his mother and watched as he turned his head to listen to her voice. Hi, baby, Jennifer says. He clearly recognized her. 
I quickly carry my baby alongside the nurse to another room where she completes his vitals and weighing. Baby Logan weighs eight pounds, seven ounces, healthy. <laughs> my head is in the clouds with our baby in my arms, my heart filled with joy. I feel totally complete. Our stay in the hospital, I probably got five hours of sleep maybe. The whole time, I'm in full protective mode. The watch guard, the first line of defense. I had new daddy duties too. I changed all the baby's diapers, did all the swaddling, and cared for the new mom. I slept with one eye opened and one eye closed every single night. On discharge day, we were all packed up and ready to go. And after a careful ride home from the hospital, Logan is home and getting all settled in. Being blessed with a baby has by far been the greatest thing that has ever happened to me. Honestly, things are just so different now. Every single day is a new adventure with baby Logan. We even decided I'd stay home with our baby. So what do you know? Now I'm a stay at home dad and the next five years of my life will be dedicated to raising my son, our first born baby boy, Logan Hunter Green. Thank you. have hidden talents. I used to be a pretty good con artist. If it was senior ditch day, but I was a sophomore, I'd find a way and even convince my parents it was allowed. Once I talked myself out of a felony. Once. <laughs> so what's a natural fit for a faker who wants to get paid bank for minimal work? A dream for a starving writer like me? modeling. I entered contests like Maxim's Girl Next Door. Spoiler alert, in no way could I be the girl next door, which is code for straight blonde hair and blue eyes. I was too short and edgy looking. But then I heard about promotional modeling. It's for personable people who have no shame, who approach strangers in public to promote stuff. We were hired by fly-by-night modeling agencies, which are run out of a storage locker. <laughs> My first gig was at the World Series in Phoenix after the Diamondbacks won, handing out free cigarettes. But I, very hungover, was not prepared to be mobbed by smokers. It was 90 degrees and I was so overwhelmed that sweat started streaming off my face. The model was blinded by sweat. Some people think of smokers as rude, but a good Samaritan smoker got napkins and continuously mopped my brow <laughs> so I could keep giving them their precious tobacco. Right away, we ran out, but still got paid five hours. The perfect hustle. I was also an intern slaving away at a nightlife magazine, unpaid, so this helped balance that out. I dove in, working four nights a week on top of my full-time commitments. At these gigs, I felt like I was rolling in a chinchilla coat with a briefcase full of cash. <laughs> I got comped drinks everywhere, entry to sold out shows at the Casbah and Sports Arena, front of the line at Ken Club, Scolari's, and on Broadway. Agencies hired me to hand out all kinds of products, and the leftovers filled my car and my apartment and then storage. <laughs> Other models would trade me boxes of sunscreen and tank tops for coffee pods or gallons of smoothies. 
we'd pay for car washes and cabbies in merch. I was a promotion modeling god. But it could be shady. Sometimes you'd go places that, at best, you could get fired. At worst, you get mugged or arrested. Working 80s night at Shooters, I was robbed once. Also, bar patrons accused me of doing the devil's work by giving away tobacco that gave their grandpa or mom cancer. I despised working for big pharma, banks, oil companies. My guilt wasn't enough to get me to quit, though I did come up with my own moral code. I did not market to drunk people who said they quit smoking but want a pack. And I might have sabotaged events by discouraging kids from enlisting in the military at their school. <laughs> but the perks had me hooked. As a kid, I mostly read in my room alone, yet now strangers recognized me, and I was the epicenter of the action. No matter how bumpin' the party was, it really kicked off when I got there. Huger and huger, my ego inflated. I believed the people who wanted a piece of me were my friends, and they were my friends because I was awesome. I felt untouchable and got careless. Once after work, a guy asked me about my job and I told him too much, probably because I was drunk and he was hot. In hindsight, what happened was I bragged to the bar owner that I bribe his bartenders to get free drinks. No shame. He was pissed and I could have gotten fired. Some jobs were even more awkward. Agencies needed people who could, with just a few minutes review, pretend to be an expert in a product. Such was the case when I was sent to an electronics store at Fashion Valley. We'll call it the phony store. It paid very well, but the client was pushing an old failing product before the new version was released. My job was to promote the old one. My first day, problem number one, they purposely didn't train me on the new product, which everyone asked about. And two, customers were bringing in their device to the tech support guys who pawned them off on me saying, the experts right here. If you've ever suspected that the store specialist is an idiot who can't help you fix a simple problem, you're right. <laughs> the manager saw through me and told my agency that I lacked training. I can't tolerate looking dumb. So I trained myself and soon I won over the manager and clawed my way to the top of my region. I was a modeling god. <laughs> my coworkers, well, I kept our chats casual and didn't mention my new job at a publishing office. A few of them had day jobs. The ones I learned to watch out for were the career models. Some, not all, were just fake smiles and Armani sunglasses that they didn't feel comfortable storing in the staff break room. And some would boast about the guy they date they aren't into, but he has a black no limit Amex card, so. <laughs> Quickly, I'd look around to make sure no one heard. I thought I had no shame. They were truly shameless. I was fake smiles too but only so I could win over customers, not to use or hurt people in my life. Kristen, for example, drove a Beamer and had a sweet husband. She had a stepdaughter she always called her husband's daughter, or the brat. When her husband confronted her about cheating on him, she blinked her mile-long lash implants and swore it wasn't true. And then she called her boyfriend in England on a cell phone she'd stolen from elderly people and was being sued for. Later, she tried to get me fired because she wanted only her friends on the team. Instead of working, they divvied up the merch among them and went home. It was chewing gum. 50,000 pieces of gum. <laughs> by this time, I was the youngest editor ever hired by my publisher. All day, I was secluded, working in silence, 
my side gigs met my need to get out and be sociable. And I made more per hour than at my real job. But also at 22, I didn't know how to be in charge of authors who'd never written a book or those who'd been writing for decades. Because editing is subjective. And I struggled with how to be an expert in this area where I felt so naive. Promotions, on the other hand, were clear. Hand out a thousand chocolate bars at these three spots. Show up on time to Comic-Con and you might film a promo spot with Orlando Jones. I succeeded because I followed directions. When other models flaked out, I was the backup who's not quite hot enough or who lacked the natural long blonde hair the client insisted on, but she didn't show up and there I was. But how much longer could I pretend when I so felt, so obviously felt like the odd one out? The solution was product demonstrations. I'd work alone, demoing kitchen gadgets I'd never used before and would figure out on the job. The lady I replaced had gotten paid for five shifts. She never worked. She sneaked into the store, set up, took photos, forged signatures, and left. <laughs> this is how I found myself one Saturday washing 10 pounds of potatoes in a Bloomingdale's bathroom sink, <laughs> questioning my life choices as concerned customers came in. Then as I unboxed the fryer I was selling, the store manager handed me a, hand, a headset. That's when I saw she'd aimed a camera to show close up what I'm doing on a huge screen in front of 20 chairs. Like this is the Food Network, but the low budget version where food is prepped in the bathroom. <laughs> I looked at my hands. They were dry and cracked. My polish was wrecked. I was wearing cheap costume rings and it would all be broadcast in high def. As I struggled with my cheap cutting board that was comically small, potatoes rolled across the table and onto the floor. A few hundred bucks was not enough for this. Please, please, no one come to watch. I just need to use the fryer once before I demo it. Just then, over the loudspeaker, I heard, Good morning, Bloomingdale shoppers! Delicious french fries cooking on level three. Come get a sample and see how easy it is to use the fryer. It was the walking dead. <laughs> but with exhausted people at 11 a.m. It was the waddling dead. The first zombie gets a sniff of blood and the horde comes from all over, up the escalators to see me. I'm frantically reading instructions as people gather. Fries, how long till the fries? Like they haven't eaten all day? I don't know how long to cook them. The first customer calls out, how do you season the pan? What seasonings I'm using? I check the recipe, which I'm reading for the first time as I'm using it. Garlic, salt, and pepper. No, how do you prep the pan? I check the box, nothing. Then the training packet, the directions, while the ravenous crowd grows impatient. Finally, I tell her how simple it is to season the pan. It isn't. I never actually say how. She realizes I started cooking in it already. So you didn't season that pan? To be honest, I still don't know what that means. <laughs> Does she think it's dirty? Oh, I didn't wash it first. So I lie. Oh, it was already seasoned and washed and whatever before I got it. <laughs> and that's when I notice and she sees me notice the tags still hanging off the pan. A half hour later though, I was cooking like a pro and making sales. I'm a god of a world few people want to be on top of. Yes, I can be a smooth talking BSer, but I don't want to. It turns out my day job is where I belong with people who appreciate my books and intellect. Sometimes I struggle with my old friend, Big Ego. Then I recall all the time I spent 
working in Walmart parking lots. Or I open a drawer and find 30 pieces of stale gum. And that ego deflates real fast. Those side jobs cost me my sanity, my pride, my soul. It was the hardest easy money I have ever made. In 1990-ish, I'd been an obsessive competitive triathlete and rock climber when this chick, Jen, she was this hip yogi with great hair, pierced nose, lived in a retro Airstream trailer. All the guys loved her. And she showed me triangle pose on a boulder on the bank of the Icicle River in Leavenworth, Washington. I leaned into the pose for the first time and I was like, yes, show me more because it was easy for me and I was doing yoga, which I'd always thought was about wrapping your foot behind your head and levitating. Then I did handstand and I was sold. I loved the thrill of being upside down and the strength it required. I loved feeling so strong. So turn that frown upside down. And I started regular practice then, and over the next five years or so, I took many yoga classes with lots of different teachers, mostly from the classical yoga traditions. And classical yoga is typically sedate and a lot of rules. The general belief is that life is meant to be ascended from the physical and not enjoyed as such. That embodiment is meant to be transcended in order to achieve spiritual enlightenment. I knew there was something else out there for me, something more positive and relevant to the life I was living, a life fraught with daily challenges and difficulties unique to those of us who live in the world. Five years later, I was 30-ish and found my calling in a yoga lineage for householders, Anasara Yoga. Anasara embraced all that was right and deep and rich and right with living in the world and what is right in our bodies. The mantra that if it hurts when you do that, don't do that physically, emotionally or spiritually. If it hurts, don't do it, or at least try not to do it. I found my nest. Anusara became my solace, my it's all good pill. I'm a householder, and so is everyone who lives in the world as a contributing member of society. If you pay taxes, drive a car, pay rent, have kids, have sex, eat food, you are a householder. If you live in society and are a participating part of that society, who knew? Who knew? Anasara yoga is a life affirming practice. The acknowledgement and understanding that life is good and meant to be enjoyed. The practice of seeing the good in all things. Years later, I was deep in marriage collapse and the muck and mire of child rearing. I fell even deeper more wholeheartedly into this practice. I needed this path that empowered householders that yeah, life sucks sometimes, but that's what makes life good. I needed the distraction to lift me up at some of the lowest points in my life. I needed the focus of something I was good at and could continue to grow in because at the rate my life seemed to be falling apart, I was going to lose it completely, and very likely end up nearly ready for an institution or at least a big fat dose of antidepressants and anxiety meds. Yoga became my way of successfully and constructively coping with that which I felt I had absolutely no control over. And, but also, I loved the physical practice. I had the best arms. And I was very proud of them. Hey, want to see my guns? Yoga. That's right. It was then that I entered the Anasara Yoga teacher training program for the first time. It was my way of getting through what life was throwing at me. I had been teaching yoga already for about 10 years in the fitness industry, but it was just, just the fit, physical practice. The repetitive calisthenics so popular in group exercise classes. I wanted to deepen. I needed more, and the teacher training was full of anatomy, philosophy, and study of the sacred texts of yoga, and it was also community. I met some of the greatest people in my life during that training. Women who have become lifetime friends and powerful mentors. The hours I spent with my kula, or community of the heart, became my sanctuary. 
my reprieve from the grind that my life outside of yoga had become. Some people medicate with drugs, I medicated with asana, the postures, mantra repetition, and lots and lots and lots of deep study. I loved it. And then I hated it. Teacher training is just that, learning to be a teacher, much more than just leading an exercise class. It meant really taking the time to sequence the postures in the class and decide what class of poses was the focus. Was it going to be standing poses, forward bends, back bends, twists, inversions, or a combination of all of them? And then making the sequence of poses relevant to everyday life. Why practice one-legged standing forward bend? Well, it helps build balance and confidence and stability. So if we drop our keys on an ice covered parking lot, we have the strength and tools to pick them up with a far less risk of falling than if we didn't have the practice behind us. It took me ages to figure out a good class and I had far more bad ones than good ones in the end. And along with the class of poses decided for the class was the requirement of a relevant theme. So a class of backbends may have a theme such as trust bending backwards into that which you can't see. And what is the emotion needed and how does that feel? Confidence, right? Faith. And a class of forward bends may be themed around mindfulness. As you bow forward, take this time for introspection, to quiet your busy and distracted mind and focus on one thing. So every class must have a focus on a particular class of poses and a complementary theme. Theming a class was hard for me, so hard. My hummingbird mind would often get caught up in my personal life distractions that I would inevitably theme a class directly from whatever my, was going on in my life. So my, my ex had just passed away and I was being observed for certification. And the class was focused on backbends and the theme was heart opening. So hands up like a tent revival. And then I broke into tears and played Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Yeah, tanked the tent revival. It became forward bending crying yoga. No one likes that yoga. I didn't get certified that day. I would take week after week after week of trainings with my teacher. Getting it right, but mostly getting it wrong because that's the work. And I struggled so hard. But it was still my solace, a lovely distraction from the reality of my daily life at home with problems. Yoga had problems for me that I could solve. Me. I had the control where I didn't in my home. Now years have gone by and I sit and think, wow, I put a lot of work into my classes. Hours. Blood, sweat, and tears. I've earned the equivalent to a PhD in yoga. Maybe even three PhDs. I always remind myself that I really know not much. But maybe that's enough. I've got over 30 years into my yoga journey. Every minute I have been and always will be a student. And that is a comfort, knowing that I'll never know it all. I look at covers of Yoga Journal and I get pissed off. I mean, really, because that's a great sell for pain-free yoga and a completely natural tan. Commodifying the uncommodifiable. I teach with context and purpose, not theory, lies, showboating, abstract equations, or claims of being the reincarnation of Hindu deities. I do the work, capital W, and it's hard, really hard, but it's my solace. It challenges me in ways I sometimes think will push me over the edge. And the practice is just that, practice. There is no end game, it's life. It's my life, and I am forever grateful to have it and the blessing it has helped make my life into out of the catastrophe I thought it was and what it could have been if I didn't have yoga. And it pisses me off, and I love it. Thank you to all of our coaches and our fearless leaders, Justin Hednall and Jennifer Corley for making this show happen. We can't wait to see and hear from you for next month's VAMP, and long story short, we love you, stay safe, stay healthy, and be happy. Goodbye. Smile.